to our colleagues in the Sand Harbor Fire Department for sharing their space with us again. Um, they've been very generous and sounds as good if I can theoretically it's on. Can anybody hear that? No. Not good. I was that? No. No. That's a good point, bro. Is that good? No. Yes. No. Okay, hold on. If I swallow it, you'll know why I am. It's just a little closer. Um, uh, so this is the November meeting of the board. Thank you to the fire department for their uh, terrific hospitality and help to us. On these meetings, it has allowed us to broaden the live participation considerably, and uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, um, I call to order and introduce for approval uh, and write a motion to approve the minutes of October 12, October uh, executive session, October 12, regular session, um, October 27, executive session, and October 27, uh, work session. I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The um, minutes are approved. I will open with the mayor's report. Um, and uh, report that we do have a um, number of things on the uh, agenda this evening uh, that mostly will connect to uh, individual departmental reports. Um, but uh, I will mention that we are in the uh, continuing public hearing for the uh, waterfront overlay district and two related matters that have come together as a, a trifecta of uh, introductions. Um, we had in the uh, last couple of weeks a storm that in some respects um, was undersold and wound up uh, bringing us a higher tide and uh, a, a more troublesome wind pattern than we had in the, the fancier storm <laughs> the weeks before. And one consequence of that is that the transient dock took a beat. And um, as a measure of the uh, severity of the storm, you know, the transient dock, those floats, they tie together with uh, steel gadgets. Uh, some of those were sheared off as if cut by a saw. So uh, that we survived the storm. Uh, the flooding was manageable. We had uh, very little in the way of tree damage. Uh, but we did suffer damage there, and at the uh, uh, on the east dock of the dinghy dock, the more substantial part of the dinghy dock, so we had a couple of poles uh, lifted right out of the water, and that led to some damage to that float as well. So we'll have at least one legacy from the fall storm season uh, that's going to translate to some expense to the village. Uh, the uh, county did not uh, declare an emergency. Um, uh, nor did the state. So we are not eligible for the kind of emergency uh, assistance on public facilities like uh, the waterfront that we otherwise would if it had been a declared emergency. Uh, we will work uh, to other alternatives. Um, the prospect of the uh, long-term uh, project to resurface uh, Route 114 is underway. Uh, there have been uh, meetings this week. There are meetings. Assemblyman uh, 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 Thiel and I met with DOT uh, this morning. And uh, the community has to be prepared for um, uh, some disruption and some inconvenience with a major resurfacing of 114. It's a critical corridor. It is a state highway. It's a state project. Um, the work will cover from 
uh, Stephen Hand's path, path all the way to the ferry uh, at the end of Ferry Road. Uh, the, I always get a kick out of the South Ferry being in North Haven. That's the one we're talking about. And um, that work will be beginning in the spring and uh, a lot of work to do there. Um, we've urged upon the uh, working group uh, to be as uh, uh, helpful and timely in their communications as they possibly can be so that we can um, help everybody anticipate uh, some of the difficulties that go with that. Um, I was a DOT commissioner, I think some of you know, and what I learned that early on is this um, uh, no pain, no gain. There's some jobs you just can't do without some uh, inconvenience, at least to, to folks. Um, the um, other matters that I will cover, I'll cover in the um, uh, departmental reports. Uh, our treasurer is out tonight, but I want to ask um, uh, the clerk, uh, Kate Picasso, to make the treasurer's report, which is in the packet. So as of September 30th, 2021, our revenues are up over the prior year. Dock transient revenue, revenue is up 38,000. Building department income from fees increased is up 48,000. Justice court fines and fees backlog has increased roughly 223,000. Expenditure spending is up over the prior year. The justice court has additional 25,000 in ticket processing fee due to additional tickets being processed. Dock expenses are up from the utilities at Long Wharf, 25,000. The sewer fund has seen additional spending of 75,000 for repairs and equipment related to the sewer lines. And we are currently, we are still fiscally on track for spending at 31% and we are comfortable with the outlook over the next eight months. Great, thank you. Um, the key words there are, um, key word there is up. Uh, many of these categories are experiencing uh, increases over last year in terms of revenues. Uh, the waterfront is a big, big part of that, as you know, and uh, the court system is getting uh, ever closer back to the level of activity uh, that we had in prior years. Um, the um, Uh, did, you, did you do this, uh, Kate, the October reconciliation? Is that part of the report? It's just part of it. It's part of the report. Uh, the bank reconciliation statements are attached to the treasury's report that are in the um, facts. Um, I will make the uh, reports of the um, the works departments. Um, during the in recent weeks, uh, Public Works has um, re, uh, uh, has performed repairs, replacement on 1,000 feet of sidewalks uh, throughout the village uh, at a cost that just about doubled our budget for uh, repairs, uh, but all necessary work. Uh, you can see those uh, good looking new uh, squares <laughs> here and there and everywhere. Um, there is more work to be done, but this was an extraordinary effort by Public Works, and uh, I think we all owe them the debt for getting that much work done uh, during a time when the village was very busy. Uh, this fall has been a very busy season, uh, and that is uh, good news. Um, on October 26th, and I mentioned in my report, um, we had that storm. We had in a single afternoon four inches of rain. That's an extraordinary amount. And when you put it together with the, um, we had uh, three and a half uh, inches uh, some weeks before that. So we're getting a lot more rain. Um, I don't mean to open that discussion, but uh, there's a lot more rain out there in the universe uh, that's coming to town. Um, the number of small branches that we had to contend with was very manageable. We had no uh, very big uh, trees go down. So it was mostly a lot of water, a lot of tide uh, in the October storm. Um, the uh, season has opened on a leaf pickup. It runs for the month of November. And uh, again, we ask that people uh, put their leaf piles uh, out in front of their property, um, uh, not in a way that blocks the roadway. And um, in due course, the department will come by uh, with their vacuum and their trucks and uh, take it all away. 
Um, and uh, as always, our thanks to uh, Public Works and Highways. Um, the Harbors and Docks report was also mentioned already. Um, income is up. We are uh, at this point in the year, compared to a year ago, we are $287,804 ahead of last year. So a quarter million dollars plus. Um, but don't get too excited because we've got a lot of work to do, including our latest uh, matter of the, uh, getting the transient dock uh, knocked around. Uh, we do have an engineering firm already looking at uh, the necessary long-term work on the transient dock. So you'll hear more about that as we go. But uh, the performance of the department, uh, the harbor, harbors has just been uh, terrific. Um, we processed just in this month alone, um, uh, another $17,268 um, of uh, transient dockage that we processed through this new computer system we're in. So uh, all well there, subject to the uh, weather. Um, there were the usual number of patrols, um, no particular incidents of note, and uh, we will um, uh, look forward to giving uh, a further report when we figure out uh, what, what kind of uh, numbers we're looking at on the transient dock. Um, and with that, I will turn it to uh, Deputy Mayor Gardella for Police, Fire, Department, Ambulance Corps for the Public Safety Agencies. Thank you, Mayor. So the uh, Sac Harbor Police Department in the month of October of 2021 answered 599 calls for service. There was one aggravated unlicensed operation, two suspended registration, one aggravated harassment, one criminal contempt. There were 12 motor vehicle accidents, and we had five arrests and 44 uniform traffic tissue, uh, tickets issued, along with 220 parking summons for the month of October. Well, as the fire department goes, in the month of October, the fire department volunteered for over 1,115 man hours. During the month, the officers and members of the department responded to 44 calls for service. These calls included two outside fires, and three motor vehicle accidents. This uh, past October, October, every October is fire safety month. Um, the Sag Harbor Fire Department participated in this by hosting an open house where we conducted a vehicle extrication demonstration and taught proper ways to extinguish oven fires. Uh, the department also taught fire safety during the morning, morning program for the elementary school. Um, this year during the pumpkin trail, our very own hot dog heroes were at Main Street Firehouse handing out hot dogs. They gave out over a thousand hot dogs. In wow. A lot of hot dogs. Uh, we also, we had a meeting uh, last week with uh, PW Grocer. It's on the agenda for tonight to be approved uh, to take a look at, I don't know if the public's aware, but we worked on a grant my last year and his chief for $250,000 for the firehouse kitchen, which has finally been approved by the state. Uh, in that grant, we included the cost of the heating system, which was around 35,000. So we're gonna, we're pushing to get that money reimbursed for the village. Uh, we're doing some work in the kitchen with the appliances that we will hopefully be able to put into the new building. Uh, PW Grocer is working on an RFP to go out to bid for site engineering, mechanical, um, and design for the new building, which we've already budgeted for. We budgeted $75,000 between the ambulance and the firehouse to get these services up and going. So that's, that's going to be coming up very shortly. Uh, that takes care of the fire department. As far as the ambulance goes, we had 63 emergency calls in October. We had five work nights, two meetings, 
13 training sessions. That's up slightly from last year. We had 60 calls for service, so we're up slightly. Uh, total man hours were 1,124. In the month of October, the Sag Harbor Ambulance received their mandatory PESH and hazmat refresher training. Uh, we also stripped and cleaned three responder vehicles and both ambulances, checking all the equipment and waxing all the vehicles. So that's the report from emergency services there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, and for the uh, sewage treatment plant and village grants, um, our colleague, Aiden Gorish. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we'll begin with the uh, report for the sewage treatment plant <clears throat> for the month of October. Total gallons received in the month were 2.3 million gallons. Total gallons of sludge removed, 41,000. DMR reports forwarded on 11-15. Suffolk County DHS inspection date, the next inspection will be 124-22. New York State DEC inspection date is open. There were no complaints. Uh, summary of operations for the month, the wastewater treatment plant running well under all permitted levels. We're now operating on three basins because the inflow and flows have decreased as the winter season is just above us. We had Suffolk County Health Department out for their inspection of the plant and everything went well. The flow decrease from, from September to October was approximately 157,000 gallons. Um, that concludes the report for the sewage treatment plant. Uh, report for grants is short but sweet. This week we've been waiting to hear from the town of Southampton. We had a grant application to the CPF Water Quality uh, for design and engineering area K. Um, for sewage um, service area expansion, area K is portions of Long Island Avenue, Howard Street, Garden Street, some Spring Street, Bridge Rose and Meadow. I'm delighted to say they approved $477,000 so that we can begin all of the design and engineering work, which means that that will can run alongside the similar project on the east side of the village where we have area L and we already had secured money for that. So we're hoping that this project will be in a good position to meet some federal funds uh, next year, so we could actually sewer connect about 75 homes that are the most polluting through no fault of their own, and only to charge it, um, that have, uh, you know, some of these homes likely have a septic system sitting in groundwater. So if we can connect 75 homes, um, it'll be a wonderful achievement. So we're moving ahead on that. So I really thank the town of Southampton and the town of East Hampton for the generosity. It will make a big difference to us. Um, I have a short report for summer paid parking. Uh, I don't know if anybody managed to pick it up on the way in. Um, we start off with the good news, we all survived. Um, we're all still here. Uh, it was a pretty decent summer on the wharf. Um, if you don't have one, I can pick it up on the way out. And we'll just do a quick recap. Um, it was from May to October, 10 a.m. to midnight. From 10 to 6 p.m., you could park for three hours. From 6 to midnight, you could park for five. Uh, between 10 a.m. and midnight, midnight, you had to initiate a park mobile session. First hour was always free, and subsequent hours were always $4. Um, all the proceeds were ring fenced at the meeting um, when, we, when we approved this to be used to fund village transportation and infrastructure projects. So um, anybody on the dock who didn't have a cell phone could have approached a TCO or Sac Harbor System Dock Master for help, and the cell phone was available for that purpose at the Dock Master's office. Suffolk County, or sorry, Sag Harbor Fire Department and Sag Harbor Ambulance Corps volunteers were always allowed to park for free. And all they had to show was their, their membership badge. There was no special sticker or decal was needed for that. And I had no complaints of anybody being ticketed for taking up that, uh, that opportunity. Um, in the beginning, uh, when, we, when we launched the service, as well as uh, monitoring the wharf, we were handing out the brochures which showed where we were charging for parking and where we were not. So, so, so we had um, Long Wharf was outlined in green and then there were 13 other parking lots in the village, uh, parking locations that are available for free. So anybody who did, this was available, we put these on some windshields down there during the month of May and June. Uh, they were also available at uh, Village Hall. So if people didn't want to pay um, for parking, uh, we gave them an opportunity to be able to source other parking in the village. And this did not include any streets in the village that have no white lines on them. This is just where we, the village, have, have laid out white lines to indicate parking. Um, total revenue um, was $64,616.95. In 
Now we had 12,589 trans successful transactions. I know there were issues people said with cell phones and everything else, but we did have 12,589 transactions. I think that's pretty good for the first year out. Um, our net revenue was $57,531.49. So the net proceeds represented 89% of the gross revenue, which I think is a pretty pretty efficient operation. Um, our partners in this park bill ran it very well. Um, by the time we paid our credit card fees and park bills, 30 cents a transaction take, we were left with 89%. So I was pretty pleased with that. Um, and hopefully we can get that number up a little bit next year. I received three written complaints over the course of the summer. That's not to say there were other people who had um, complaints are grumbling about it, but there was three written complaints and two of those were people who got parking tickets because they didn't pay. Um, <laughs> the, of the 12,589 transactions, about 40% or just over 5,000 people left their zip code with the transaction. So that was a pretty good sample for us. And if you pick this up on the way out, you'll see that we had visitors from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, Massachusetts, DC, Rhode Island, Vermont, Delaware, uh, Virginia, New Hampshire, and Maine. Not surprisingly, the vast majority came from New York. It was 4,070 uh, people from New York left their zip code. New Jersey was next with 575. So it really did fall off after New York. Um, doing a little bit of math on the spreadsheet, uh, the, zip, the zip code sample we had represented about 40% of the total number of paid parking transactions and provide a really excellent window into the makeup of our village visitors and long wharf parkers. Uh, the four, of the 400 and, or the 4,070 New York transactions, the 11963 zip code accounted for just 230. According to the post office, village of Sag Harbor is approximately one third of the population in the zip code for just over 2,000. I believe the zip code is 6,000 plus. Um, and that would mean that for the, out of the 40% sample, just 77 transactions were undertaken by village residents. Um, and then again, working with that 40% sample, we can deduce that the total net revenue of the total net revenue of $57,531, just 1,801 came from the 11963 uh, zip code, and uh, which would mean about $600 came from the village residents, about 1% of the total. Um, there were also, if you look at this spreadsheet with 12 to 12,000 and odd lines, there were a lot of zero dollar transactions from within 11963 area code, uh, zip code, sorry, indicating that many local visitors took advantage of the first hour being free. Um, in July, the Verizon antenna and the cupola of the municipal building went live, and that enhanced the service down there. It did make a difference. There's also Wi Fi down there that we put in over the summer, and um, so that'll be helpful for next year. Um, I reached out to AJ, we have cameras down there, and asked him to pull pictures of what Long Wharf looked like over the July 4th weekend and over the Labor Day weekend. So we have pictures from July 2, 3, 4, and 5, taking at, taken at noon, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, July 4th is very wet, wet and windy uh, for the first few days, but uh, there was parking available at noon, there was parking available at 3 o'clock, at six o'clock on the on the second and in the evening. Um, same is true true for the third. Um, for the fourth, it got a little tighter by the time the evening came, the wharf was full. And the same for the fifth, it, it got a lot busier. But the the interesting thing is that I it seems to me that um, Main Street employees were not parking on the wharf anymore because before we introduced this, you could park at one minute past three in the afternoon and stay on Long Wharf legally until midnight. So you could park there for nine hours straight because we have three hour parking and we don't enforce, we didn't enforce after six o'clock. So you park at 301, your, your three hours expires at 601 and you're free to stay there right through midnight. I think this allowed for greater turnover of vehicles, which is very helpful uh, for the village budget and also to uh, customers on Main Street, that there seemed to be more parking available there. And this is anecdotal, this is just me going down, having a look um, during the week. Um, paid parking again over Labor Day weekend was similar, not quite as busy as it was over July 4th, but if you pick up this, you can see those pictures on the way out. Um, I reached out to the Chamber of Commerce and asked them if they could poll some of their members to see what their reaction was. And so they got 22 responses. Um, did paid parking have a positive, negative, or no noticeable effect on your business? Uh, positive, 0%. 
uh, negative 28, no effect 41, and not sure it was 31. So you can make what you like from that. Did you feel any complaints regarding paid parking? Yes, 58%, no, 42%. Were people confused and had to engage with the process of the mobile app? Yes, 79%, no, 21%. Now, this is 22 respondents. We had over 12,000 transactions, successful transactions. Um, almost all the negative comments said the Wi-Fi was an issue and the app didn't work well or was cumbersome, especially for older folks. Do you have any additional comments? Um, alienated locals and visitors alike. Uh, well, what are seniors or anyone without a cell phone supposed to do? Keep it simple. Well, we had a phone in, uh, we had a phone at the uh, Doc Masters uh, hot hut down there. Our year long longtime customers are not used to parking on the wharf to run errands, so they simply found other roads to park on or past the village. Anyhow, you can read these for yourself. I'm not going to go through a whole lot. We go a lot on the agenda. Um, as was mentioned earlier, all funds raised from paid parking are ring fence for transportation infrastructure, and that includes a whole host of things, including you know fixing sidewalks to be one. And to try and put some perspective on this, if you're familiar with the repair down the Madison Street um, across from the monument, that's about a five foot by 50 foot or 250 square foot repair, $10 a square foot, that's about 2,500 bucks. So what we raised on paid parking net this year, we could do 22 of those, or we could do bike racks, or we could do bike lanes, or we could do all sorts of other things. Um, I think it was successful. Um, obviously, um, there's gonna be a plethora of a wide range of opinions. And I think as part of the code when we wrote it, we will have a review of paid parking in February before we decide to move ahead with it for next year. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Aidan. And the uh, housing, uh, affordable housing initiative of uh, Bob's. I'll just, I think, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's about the follow up. Anyway, um, Ed and I are working on this. It's been, there have been a number of articles uh, just recently in the Washington Post, New York Times, about how this is a national issue. And uh, how we are, uh, Colorado is passing or wants to have legislation to uh, for raise taxes as New York did for affordable housing. So people are coming out of the woodwork with ideas, that is sort of generally speaking ideas. And then there are also a few, we've been approached by a few people, individual uh, uh, people who have, are thinking about different locations in the village. One thing that's interesting is, um, Currently, there's a proposed, it's a 40 unit um, complex on uh, Route 39 in Southampton. And they had a meeting uh, uh, last week, this was reported in the press, and there was a fair, a surprising amount of resistance. Um, it, it, people were saying things like, well, won't that increase the traffic? Or it puts them right there. It was kind of an odd, I thought it was an odd take on it. Um, in any event, um, we are pushing ahead. It's and I say, say it's clearly a national issue. It's not. It's not just here. And the, as we've said all along, the village itself, the village per se, does not have a lot of room to do anything significant. Um, so that leaves the periphery, the town of East Hampton, the affordable housing committee, go to Southampton. So these these they tend to be organic, they become about organically. Some of them will assemble a piece of property, they'll, they'll approach their various funding avenues for these things. State funds, stack tax credits, I don't get it all. There's, a, there's, a, uh, there's one private one. Um, but anyway, so we're, we're gonna be issuing our, our list of recommendations <laughs> and we just wanna sort of keep, and correct me if wrong, Ed, we wanna keep just an open, discourse going with, with uh, we have like six seven people on this committee now and as more people want to join that's fine and or if more people want to uh, email into that group that would be great too just to keep all the current ideas percolating so that's um it's pretty much where we are at this point although i have to say it's a really it's a hot topic that's for sure a lot of people have approached us and there's been a lot of uh, national press about it as well. So um, anyway, there we are. <laughs> when one person did say, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, that's my report. Right, thank you, Bob. And uh, Trustee Hay, uh, Mash Park, 
and the Justice Court, and then we'll go further on the housing unit. Is this working? No. Read your wall. Can you show? Yes, I can do that. As I said, <laughs> exactly. And I'll be brief anyway. Um, so um, I'll start with Nash Park. Um, the fall sports season for Pearson is winding down. A couple of teams have made um, playoffs, but it was great to see that the school and the school was using the park facilities um, for cross country soccer, field hockey, and things are going smoothly there. Um, in addition, the school and the park board are currently meeting still on a weekly basis, developing a long term capital plan for the park facilities, um, upgrades of fields, buildings, etc. Um, um, they've uh, They've agreed, both the parks architect and the school's architects have met and are working together um, with updated surveys um, of the park um, to lay out upgrades and um, upgrades and enhancements of the existing fields and structures. Um, once that work is done, um, then I think a, a more public process will begin of, of discussions about um, what what the two what the two entities are planning to do with the facilities at the park. Um, uh, but again, the process has been very constructive. Um, both teams working very closely together on a <clears throat> weekly basis, meeting every week and communicating sometimes almost daily about the work. And there's quite a bit of work that has to be done for this, um, what will be a pretty significant capital planning process um, to upgrade the park facilities. Um, that's the park report. Um, for the, the, the Village Justice Court, um, as the mayor alluded to, um, the Village Justice, Justice Court is back on track for where it was in 2019. Um, case volume was down dramatically in 2020, not surprisingly. Um, there were 265 cases opened in October, 489 closed in October, um, 35 opened were um, vehicle traffic, 52 closed were vehicle traffic, two open were criminal, one closed was criminal, one open civil case, one closed civil case, um, village ordinances, no new cases, six were closed, parking, which is the vast majority of the cases that come to the village court, um, 227 open, 429 closed. Um, currently, there are approximately 590 cases open in front of the village court. Um, the backlog, of course, has grown over the past decade, but is not that significant still. Um, in addition, as the mayor alluded to, um, the village court is bringing in um, a comparable level of revenues that it did in 2019. Um, in 2019, it brought in over 650,000 in revenues. About 10% of that um, goes to the county and state. About the rest stays for the village. And the village justice court is on track to bring in this a comparable amount of revenues again this year. Um, again, the court is not really about bringing in revenues. It's about it's for the convenience of the community. But certainly, we want the court to be self-sufficient, self-funding, and to the extent it contributes to the village um, coffers, that's great too. That's the village justice court report. And thank you. I guess the whole thing is down at this point. Why can we? This is working. No, no, no. no. Okay. Um, we have uh, a visitor here tonight. I'd like to welcome him to uh, follow on the departmental reports. He is our man in Southampton. He is uh, recently reelected. 
uh, the distinguished councilman, uh, Tommy John Scavone, if you would come up and Good to see you. I came here to uh, speak in public portion on the uh, on Steinbeck Park. But well, I, I know your schedule is busy, so um, we're happy to have you do it right now. Okay, very good. I don't think any of these work, are they? <laughs> but, uh, well, like mayor, members of the board, thank you. It's good to see you. And uh, I come here as councilman uh, re-elect, and I know that I have quite a few people in this room to thank for that. And uh, so we, we move forward and listening to you all, it's really uh, great to hear the things that you're working on. Um, and so many of the things that you're working on, we've been working on together, Tom, you know, as a commissioner of Bay Point Fire District, Noyak Fire District, we're real happy about a quarter million dollar grant here. Um, and we're looking forward to working with you in the future. Aiden, that grant, Awesome. I think that's fantastic. We look forward to another one next year. Indeed. Bob, I'm a liaison to the housing uh, committee in Southampton. Uh, of course, the Peconic Bay transfer, it, a, a community housing fund has been passed. We're going to be looking to uh, have that public referendum pass next year. So we'll have a real funding uh, source. And I'm hoping that the villages and the town can work together on real answers for affordable housing. And Ed, thank you for working on the park with the school, oh my goodness, been there, um, not an easy one, <laughs> knows what I'm talking about. And uh, Mayor, thank you for your leadership. I'm real happy that you are considering changing uh, the zone for uh, Steinbeck Park tonight. Uh, you know, um, it's it's been a long road and, you know, changing it from office district to, to uh, parks and conservation it is really fantastic. We were on this years ago. Um, you know, the town of Southampton bought it in uh, 2000, July 2018, turned it over to the village. We have an IMA for uh, the park. So I'm here to lend my support and, you know, wholehearted support for this change of zoning. I'm looking forward to having this park as you are. Uh, looking forward to having this park in the public domain forever. It will outlive all of us. So thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Uh, would your motion to accept the departmental reports? Second. Those sure. in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. The reports are approved. We go into public comment period. We've got a lot of people here tonight, so if you're coming up for a comment, I ask you to please stay within the three minute rule. We don't have a hope, um, <laughs> but we can get one. <laughs> I'll just try and talk loud. Jane Holden, um, I'm a lifelong resident of San Paulo. Regarding uh, public housing, affordable housing, the problem is one of them is that people don't realize what is considered affordable housing out here is not what's considered in other areas. And they're terrified it would be what is in other areas, it's not what we did here. What I want to discuss, and I asked him if I could come up and do this because I have to do it. I was at last month's meeting, and there was a letter presented regarding the tower and, Red, and a lot of things said about Reddit. Not only did I grow up in Sag Harbor, I've lived here for 75 years. 21 of those years were in Reddit. And most of them, we were the only family that lived there all year round because the road would flood and people couldn't get in and out. And at that time in the 50s and early 60s, Redwood was actually considered living on the wrong side of the tracks. Only people only wanted to be there in the summer. And then the uh, 60s came back and the people that come back from World War II and that decided to raise the road. They dredged so that what is now uh, Ship ashore, Marine could be there. When you come into Redwood, you go up a hill. When you start down, the properties on the right, which are on the north side of Redwood Road, all the way up to Dartmouth, they were all built on silt. That was all dredged up and put in. Silly Spong, all those multi million dollar houses. 
And part of them, I'm very shocked they were allowed to be there because part of it was supposed to be a park. It was not supposed to be touched. The ones that are right on Glover Street. And that's all filled. And people come up here and they said, oh, well, it's environmentally unsafe, the, the tower. It wasn't that people didn't think of environment when this was done. They thought what was best for the whole community. We need that tower. If someone comes in and says, oh, I have 200 signatures that don't want the tower. That's a drop in the bay compared to the amount of people that tower allows WLNG to reach and to help. And, that's and, and when it was first done, I remember I was in high school and I remember the discussions of how did they get permission to put a radio station there. <laughs> Well, I understand Rage Sofa Tower is going to be added with Which is a very that different tower. Right. But most of the people complaining when they bought their properties, you could not have bought a house in Redmond in the last 50 years and said you didn't know that that tower, that bus, and that radio station didn't exist. So to come in now and complain and say you don't like them, you probably got a reduction on your sale price. Because I've been selling real estate here for 40 years, so I know. Gina, I have to remind you the time. Okay. What it has to is I hope you will consider the people that are helped by a good cell phone tower. Because an emergency is when you need something or an ambulance or something and you use your cell phone and you're being told all lines, circuits are busy, or your phone call keeps getting disconnected. We have more people out here. We might not like it, but service that it needs to be done. And thank you for letting us know. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> Other comments for, for the public comment period? Yes. My name is Dave Kennedy. I lived here all my life. And uh, I came here specifically to ask the trustees to exempt me from the moratorium. Now I want to explain what that, that entails. That's all that does is allow me to continue my permit process. It doesn't give me a permit. It doesn't give me anything. It just allows me to continue my permit process. I've been, and the reason why I'm asking for this, they took down my property, uh, down my building. It was no fault of mine. I should be, I should be exempt because I'm pre-existing. I had my application into the village long before they ever put in the, the moratorium. And um, I have letters from this, the village attorneys permitting me to build a building, but this building, the village is denying these, these me permission. They say it was illegal. <clears throat> well, maybe it's illegal, but that doesn't mean it any less binding. And I want the trustees to vote on this. Seems I got you all together here at the same time. It's, um, I'm really frustrated. It's been a long time. I've, I've been seven years in this application. I've been turned away 24 times. They've been tabling me 24 times. Um, it's very frustrating. And I don't know if I'm gonna live long enough to get this. I really don't. I'm really upset with it. I don't have to tell everybody that, um, and I think you should approve it just because I'm a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> We'll leave it at that. And I would like the, the trustees to to approve to approve to approve this. As I said, it only allows me to continue my permit process. It doesn't give me a permit. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. I'm Michelle Leo, um, a long time, well, my whole lifetime resident of St. Barbara. I'm 40, so that's 40 years. I can't, I can't claim 75, but 
I'm getting there. Um, anyways, I just wanted to come and um, express my support for the affordable housing initiative that the district is trying to work on. Um, affordable housing is not just affordable, but it's attainable, which is another sort of nuanced word that we need to recognize. Um, I would likely qualify for affordable housing, but thanks um, to a grandmother who left me some inheritance money, I got a down payment, right? And that's not everybody's story. That's just my unique story that made it so that my husband and I, both lifetime residents of St. Harbor, are now able to own a home here and have our kids in district. Um, but it's getting interesting to be in district. The demographic is getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And even myself and my husband, who are not so poorly off, can't really keep up with the um, the our, our new constituents that have, have come in now with COVID. And I think it's important for our children and sort of what their exposure is, is to ensure that we have a um, demographic that is, is dynamic and expressive of uh, the American melting pot that we are. Um, and uh, it's really important to um, propel these initiatives forward. Um, and I wholeheartedly support it and will show up to any committee. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else? Come forward. I'd just like to say one thing, you know. <laughs> You know, affordable housing is nice, but what we have to do is stop the gouging by the people that own the houses. That's what we have to stop. I mean, I could go to a to rent a house now, five thousand dollars or four thousand dollars for a one bedroom apartment. That's gouging. You got to stop that. You can't. We got to be able to stop that somehow. I don't know how to do that, but that's what's happening. I have two affordable housing rentals in San Carlos. And they're both affordable. But as I said, I'm doing my part. I don't know if everybody else is doing theirs. <laughs> Thank you again, Jim. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor and members of the board. Um, my name is Brian E. Frazier. I've met with you. Um, thank you very much. I'm a resident of Sag Harbor Village and I'm a member of East End DMV. Yes, in my backyard. We are advocates for community housing, attainable housing, um, and we are so thrilled with the way that this, this administration is prioritizing this. Um, I'm a social worker. My husband's a teacher at Pearson, um, and we live here like Michelle because we are fortunate through a fluke of family privilege um, and not we wouldn't be able to live here um, and do what we do. Um, we are, we have, East End DMB has compiled a few recommendations for inclusionary zoning that we have shared with you, but I just wanted to share it with everyone. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, in Bob and Ed, and we've met with you guys and we're, we're thrilled. I, I, I wanna know sort of what is the next step? Once you've compiled the recommendations, you know, what is the next step and is there a time frame? Um, and I might just suggest five things that, that we have compiled together. One is a possibility of a teardown tax. Um, when somebody demolishes a single family home and erects a bigger single family home, they should have to pay a tax. Um, and that revenue should go towards more affordable community housing. Another idea is inclusionary zoning changes to allow conversion of single family homes to multifamily homes. We don't, five people don't need to live in a gajillion bedroom home. We could be housing firefighters, nurses, social workers, teachers in there. Um, ADUs, tiny homes. I know there's a lot of people in our group who would like to put one on their property who can't right now because of the, um, the zoning. Um, implementing a workforce housing district for the workers in our community. Um, and finally, second and maybe even third floors above retail um, on Main Street are just, you know, those are just five. There are people who've been doing, I'm not an expert in this, I'm just passionate and, um, you know, we're going to be here to support whatever you guys are doing. And um, I did last minute put in a, a request for a rally. I don't know if, you, if it made it onto here. Um, 
but we're hoping to have I, I spoke with Connie yesterday, but it was, you know, it was like 10 minutes before four and we got it in. But basically, we'd like permission to host a small gathering, not a protest, it's a support for the community housing initiatives that, that this village is is shepherding. Um, we were hoping December 4th uh, at the windmill and it will have East End Gimby signs and it'll be an educational gathering of people just to raise awareness about the need for this housing um, and to support the village. So I don't know if that made it in. I don't know if it's illegal. I'm, I'm, I don't it think it made it in. Okay. But what time of day on the 4th? We can be flexible, maybe two to four. I think the tree lighting is later. That's is that what, right? That's what we have. Um, is that at five? I think the times will conflict. Okay. But, um, we could do it on Sunday. We just we're hoping for a rain day option, so that's why we can do it Saturday at six thirty. Okay. Oh. Why don't you stop in Bill Till tomorrow and see what we can do? Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And anyone who wants to become involved with us, we're meeting monthly at my house in Sag Harbor Village. Like us on Facebook, East End DMV, and and we'll put you on our mailing list. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that will close the public comment uh, section. And we go now to introductions. Uh, uh, item number 7-1. This is a local law creating village code chapter 76, cannabis. The opt out of allowing retail cannabis dispensaries. Um, the story behind this, as you know, is the state has uh, moved toward legalization. Uh, the villages um, and jurisdictions are uh, given the option of opting in or out of a portion of the statute. Uh, we, uh, the board here and this mayor, are not ready to take a position on that yet. We're opening the process by this introduction tonight. Um, under the statute, we need to be um, either opted in or opted out of the new system by the 31st of December. So um, we don't have a position other than to uh, give us this option uh, procedurally uh, to have this as an open matter. So it is an introduction. Uh, so I would invite an introduction uh, motion to introduce uh, local law number uh, code chapter 76. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Uh, Deputy Mayor, is there a second? Second. Second. Um, any further discussion? Um, stay tuned. More to, more to come. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The matter is agreed to. <clears throat> Next up is local law amending zoning the uh, uh, <clears throat> chapter 300. This is the uh, village uh, waterfront overlay. Uh, which has been the subject of our open public hearing now uh, for the last couple of months. Um, and it is, um, oops, okay. Um, we'll come back to that in one second. Uh, I skipped uh, the Suffolk County Community Development Citizen Ideas Wanted. Uh, this is a process uh, that we have every year where the Suffolk County Development Corporation invites uh, the public should come forward with ideas on governance and uh, public policy. Uh, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Hello, any discussion? Laws indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The matter is agreed to. And now, uh, the continuing public hearing on uh, chapter 300. Um, the hearing is resumed. Our, um, uh, they would wish to be heard in the public hearing on the zoning proposition. Yes, sir. Are we doing back there on voices? Okay. I'm Rowan Ames Allen Brown. Um, the first thing I want to do is donate a set of microphones to the village. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to be in front of the board. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. I thank uh, the mayor, the board, uh, even the previous mayor for the dedication to the village and their efforts in undertaking this zoning amendment to preserve the beauty and history of Sag Harbor, especially in light of the trade-offs made in the last few years and the potential for future development. <clears throat> um, I live at 56 West Water Street, which is a house kind of across from the Sag Harbor Inn, right next to the little boat basin. 
Um, and uh, I've been there for 11 years, so I'm a relative newcomer to, to the village here. Um, um, but we are certainly fortunate and blessed to be part of such a vibrant and beautiful community with such uh, great residents. <clears throat> we are one of only two single family homes that are uh, in the new proposed waterfront overlay district. There's a third single family home which at Four West Water Street, which is the old Christie Brinkley parents' house, which is as far as the map that um, Nelson Pope did, is listed as a uh, village business by the code, by the color. So I'm not gonna include that. So we're only one of the two, and I understand the need to sort of make it uh, the continuity of the boundary to get to the radio station to get to ship ashore marina <clears throat> but um, my understanding with the proposed amendments to this code is that they're really trying to be geared primarily to the non-single family residential properties in that district um, but whatever is going to be in the law is clearly going to affect our property and our neighbor's property at 62 west water street and maybe here <clears throat> so really i just wanted to go over a couple of items um, to just have the board be aware of the potential for how it might affect it and uh, just respectfully request that you revisit some of these things. The first thing is uh, in 315.3 uh, D, the height and stories, where the proposal is a permitted height of 25 feet. Now, for most commercial properties, you're going to have a flat roof. Residential properties, especially those in the historic district, which we are, are going to have two stories and then a pitched gabled roof. So our house currently right now is 28 feet over grade. Um, so the 25 foot maximum doesn't make uh, a lot of sense. But what I would respectfully uh, request the board to look to exempt us from the uh, R20 zoning, just the two houses essentially, from this particular um, part of the code um, and just revert to the a normal village current table of dimensional regulations, which right now is two stories and 35 feet. That's one. The second is uh, in G, the waterfront visual access, which is the proposal is to have 20% of the property width, but no less than 15 feet to be able to see the water. Um, I would submit to the board uh, that we or any future owners of property are deserving of some sense of privacy to, in our homes right there. We currently have screening um, on the road, except for the curb cut and another 15 feet, so less the curb cut. So again, this is something that uh, I think that the board uh, would respectfully request the board revisit, being able to exempt just these two properties from this particular um, part of the proposal. And then finally, um, J and refuse areas, the proposal is you can't locate the bins in the rear yard adjacent to the principal building. You know, we're fortunate enough to have half acre lots, blessed to have half acre lots. And we have our two bins in a little trash barrel shed, which is next to the driveway and screened by shrubbery. So again, it doesn't really make sense to have to put it next to the house in a certain place when we have the room to put it away from the house. And, and screen it from the street, which, which it is here. Um, so I would again respectfully ask the board to exempt the, our single family house in this section. The other thing which I'm unsure of, and for, I'll leave it as a question whether or not you can answer it or not, um, there is in 311.23 uses of structures greater than 3,500 square feet in the waterfront overlay district. Uh, in A, it says the Village Board of Trustees is hereby authorized to review special exemption use permit applications submitted pursuant to the section that is set forth in, and then single family residential dwellings, accessory structures, and uses located in the R20 zoning district are excluded from special exempt permit review in the village code. So I'm not really sure what that means. That means that no one can ever build a house bigger than 3,500 square feet. No, it exempts single family residential dwellings in the R20 zoning district from village board review under this section. So the village doesn't review it. Really. So that means there's no potential review or will be reviewed by. No, it it's exempts single family residential dwellings, accessory structures, and uses in R20 from the review of a uh, special exception permit requirement. Of Village board okay, but right, the proposal is that limits the structures to 3,500 square feet. No, it doesn't 
limit the structure. No, but the, 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 well, the previous sections did. I thought. No. Maybe not. No, okay, it so requires those are, village board review of structures that are over 30. Okay, feet. it's fine. So they're still subject to the dimensional right. regulations. Then. Perfect. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. And again, continue the good work. Continue to fight the good fight. Have a nice night. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, other comments? Uh, Mary Ann Eddy, 96 Hampton Street. Um, I have one comment on the same Article 15, 300-15-1, but flipping over all the way to Section I, which has to do with mechanical equipment. And it says here, um, blah, 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 roof-mounted mechanical equipment must be fully screened, blah, blah, blah. Such mechanical equipment must be set back at a distance of one, one and a, wait, one and one half times its height from the facade and must not occupy more than 20% of the total area of the roof. That effectively eliminates the possibility of any structure in the waterfront overlay district from having solar on their roofs. I don't think we really want to go there. There are a whole bunch of people in Glasgow, Scotland, there are a lot of people around the world that are very concerned about the climate crisis. And one of the most effective ways that people, individuals, <laughs> you're laughing at me, <laughs> is to use solar. And this is prohibiting solar. Solar is, it can certainly have the setbacks, but it takes up a very great portion of the total roof area. Thank you, Mary. Susan May, and I have turned my comments into the village clerk and the board of trustees. So I'll try to make my remarks brief, but I want to first mention affordable housing. Um, my law firm was kind enough to let us do a national study about eight to 10 years ago on affordable housing. Uh, we found out that we were ahead of everybody and believe it or not, Dallas, Texas. But the, the one place that found, that figured it out better than any other is their programs are still active and that's Burlington, Vermont. And as my associate who was working on it came in, he sat down in my office and he said, Bernie, figure it out. It occurred when he was mayor. So you might take a look at that, okay? And if I can find our report that was national, I'll forward it to you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I try to do this comparison um, between the, the code, the existing one, the pending one, and the proposed one. And I, this is what I turned in, and I addressed several issues, but I'm just gonna jump to about three that are, I think, terribly important. And one is limiting the um, square footage in the OD district. So it, it matches the VB district. And then the plan that was done in June, this, uh, you know, this occurred. The problem with the OD district as currently written uh, and not touching upon any uses is that with the exception of about three uses, there's no gross floor area uh, limitation. Um, and I don't think that's the way it was intended. I can't recall why that happened uh, back in 2008. Uh, but we may need to do a further planning study or something to bolster that, but it, I think it needs to be really seriously looked at. Uh, and particularly as it relates to the retail and OD, OD um, the maximum grocery, grocery store is 33,000 square feet. That and the home furnishings, those are the only, the three that are only limited to 3,000. Others can be larger. Um, I've mentioned affordable housing, looking at the code and the pending and the plan. Um, my suggestion is to follow what the plan proposed, and that is to a required set aside, and they, they suggested 10. I, I actually believe it should be 20, and this is more in conformity with what nationally they're doing. Um, they also suggested smaller sizes for the apartments. Um, our code says 800 to 2500. That's too expensive, it's two, at least two bedrooms and it could be three, not a bad idea to have some of those, but it's the smaller they are, the more affordable they are. And so the plan suggested 500 square feet for the small ones and 1200 uh, for large. Uh, private parking garage, that's an accessory use. Um, this is a not a built environment that we're working with right now. 
uh, particularly in the OD. So we need to consider what a garage is going to look like. And if it's a mechanical one, they stack them. We don't have any screening regulations. We've never had to deal with this issue before. So I suggest, um, pursuant to my comments, that we might want to consider some special uh, conditions, maybe put in a special exception requirement with some conditions that addresses that. It gives the ARB leverage when they go through the review process. Um, the height and the stories, um, the plan pointed out, and it's not in this ordinance uh, before us, that, that retail requires 13 feet new retail. I'm not talking about what we have currently. But new retail is typically 12 to 13 feet. And if it's not built that way, it won't be retail for long. So I just point that out that it was in the plan. And the Baltimore planner, I didn't like his form base, but he recognized that kind of stuff. And he actually did a pretty good job on identifying needs. And then the two story, uh, the ZBA gets requests all the time for a ceiling height that's 14 or 15 feet. And they have to ask. And Scott Baker, who's on the ZBA, does a good question to analyzing those plans, but it would be nice to have a second floor limitation so that it's not always a discussion point and it's sort of set that it can't be over, for example, 15 feet, um, no, 12 feet, sorry. Um, lot coverage, the June, uh, the June draft mentioned impervious, impervious lot coverage. Um, I just bring that up in this just to start the conversation because we're doing new sidewalks. You may want uh, for, in, for, you know, ones that are not concrete, but the, the, the water can soak into the, to the earth. There are other places that have done this. In fact, some people are ripping out their sidewalks and turning over again. Um, we have a chance in this new district as it takes shape to do some impervious coverage things. Um, impervious, excuse me, I get confused all the time. Uh, and then finally, um, I, I address the main entrance it should be on the front. Um, and um, the sidewalks in the street trees, which I think are highly important, they require special setbacks and they need to be stated in the code and they're not in the proposal. Um, they were in the June plan. So that's my comment. You know, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's it. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm Rob Calvert. I live on Laurel Lane. I'm a 15 year, year resident of the fire district and the school district. I support the WFOD, but ask that it continue to allow for apartment residential use within the office district, the OD, by special exception only. If the village is to create workforce housing, then this one provision is of strategic importance. Doing so would reflect, as you know, the priority of this board and be consistent with the comprehensive plan. It would better provide alignment with the amendment itself, where it calls for the continued support of a mixture of uses, including residential. And it would maintain the only practical pathway for implementing chapter 150, the code's workforce housing inclusionary zoning section, which calls for housing and mixed use development, development that can only occur in the office district by special exception. There are concerns, of course. Some wish to prohibit residential use in the OD because of the impact of some waterfront condominiums. But this is a matter of purposeful village enforcement and not rightful development. The second, residential use will of course impact comprehensive sewer and parking solutions. But the area south of Long Island Avenue provides the best opportunity for the village to negotiate for off-street residential workforce housing. Our local businesses say they desperately need, and don't you agree? Now the board may prefer to prohibit such housing and yet pursue it by variance with an applicant. But in doing so, it could lessen the public support for this amendment and the built changes to come. Is it the preferred path to an end that includes workforce housing 
one in which the board emphatically affirms the village's stated vision, values, and plan. One that tangibly supports workforce housing for the long term well being of the community and its businesses. Again, I encourage you to maintain the special exception for apartments in the office district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. I am Peter Kenney from 165 Division Street. I'm a board <coughs> member of Sam Snack Harbor. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking uh, for our group. Sam Snack Harbor wants us, uh, first of all, to reiterate our support for this very important effort to protect our water <laughs> and preserve its historic character. And we thank all the members of the board and the larger team that have worked on this overlay for so many months to make this happen. We've been glad to see how much you've taken on board input from the public during this process. And we're very glad to see the new draft law makes clear from the beginning how the overlay draws on comprehensive planning work and documents the village has uh, created in the past. Uh, in particular, we cheer for the language in section one that states um, its purpose of preserving the character, historical interest, and general welfare of the village, which is our own mission at Save Safe Harbor. <clears throat> We feel the waterfront overlay code is continuing to move in a good direction. Um, that said, we have several comments on the current draft uh, of the code, which we're going to write you about, but we also have a number of questions, and it seemed more important tonight to ask questions than to give a critique. So with your permission, I'd like to ask some of these questions now as quickly as I can. Can we ask what procedure, just so we know what uh, we're, we're following for implementing the new law, um, how many more public comment sessions will there be if there are changes to the law based on public comment? Uh, how does that affect the timeline? So we need to, um, it's not working. It is working. We need to uh, hear back from certain referral agencies, the Suffolk County Planning Commission, the Harbor Committee Consistency Review, um, the Planning Board down in Southampton as well. And um, after hearing back from all of those, depending on whether this board wants to make changes, if those changes are not substantive, we do not need to re-notice it and we can put it on um, for adoption at the next meeting after hearing back from all those other agencies. So it really depends on when we hear back from them. Is this next, the next meeting the OT meeting we're talking about next month? Next month, sure. If, if, it's, if we hear back from all of them and the board doesn't want any further changes to the local law. So this is the only public hearing, this is it? No, no, it's been it's been a continued public hearing since but not with the new draft. This is a new draft. Okay. So this is it. Okay. You no, know, the public hearing remains open until yeah. we act. And it's it's open at the next meeting as well. So for sure. sure. And, uh, if, if there were a substantive, substantive change, then that you'd require to, to, to re-notice the agencies or the viewers you want. I mean it depends on how substantive we could keep we're going to keep this hearing open and adjourn it to the next meeting and you could just put it back in the paper to notice those changes depending on what they are. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, the current draft defines a waterfront lot as a lot that abuts a water body or a lot that abuts a park that abuts a water body. So the definition of a butt is quite important. And I've gotten different answers from architects and lawyers about, about the legal meaning of the word. Is a property that is across the street from a park, from a waterfront park, considered to abut it? No, no. butt means next to. There's a good little uh, diagram. In the... Yeah. I, yeah. The diagram doesn't answer this question, though. No. Let me let me say, explain why I'm asking. <laughs> All the properties on the south side of Bay Street, from the corner bar to Burke Street, would be waterfront lots if they are considered to abut Marine Park, for example, a waterfront mm -hmm. park. If they don't abut, they're not considered to abut Marine Park. They're not waterfront lots, and by my understanding, our understanding of the code. They could then be three stories and 35 feet rather than two stories and 25 feet. I believe you're correct that the word abut actually means next to. Okay. Up against next so to. So that's so a share of the chair, chairing the difference in what, right. in what the treatment of those lots. Right. Okay. They actually abut a street. 
Um, can you confirm that the property is from Long Wharf and Marine Park, uh, north of uh, Bay Street, including the current Bay Street Theater and the Sag Harbor Gym property, <clears throat> or waterfront lots under that definition? I don't know which lots are which ones. Well, the Bay Street, the current Bay Street Theater, which is on Long Wharf. If they're on the water, then they're, they're okay. waterfront properties. Okay. okay. Waterfront lots. Thank you. So um, waterfront properties are required to provide visual access yards of 20% of the property width and ones that are applying to the village board for a third story height exception, um, if they're over 3,500 feet, are also required to provide a pedestrian walkway at least 10 feet wide. Just for clarification, can the pedestrian walkway be part of the visual access yard? If you're supplying a 20% visual access yard, and is your pedestrian walkway can it run through that area? Yeah. 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 Okay. As long as there's no visual obstructions. Okay, yeah. Um, the earlier drafts of this code imposed additional requirements on any property owner mm -hmm. requesting a third story height bonus. Those owners had to provide at least three other defined public benefits from a list that included restoration of wetlands or native vegetation, planting street trees of significant size, providing waterfront walkways or waterfront recreation facilities, and so on. That has been dropped in the current uh, draft of the code. They seem like highly desirable things if the goal of the code is to enhance the waterfront and maximize the values of the community of you know, a uh, very large building. Uh, what was the reason for removing those requirements from this draft of the code? To the extent that uh, they were not included, I mean, I, I'd have to look exactly why they weren't, but it's typically a policy decision as to whether or not you include certain provisions. I think the most important one that was brought forward from the prior code was the, um, this is for the height, the trade off for high bonus, right? Yeah. So that you, if you were to get the high bonus, you have to supply in addition of, to the visual yeah, access that was, yards. That was sort of like, like a, yeah, that was like a menu provided. If you want to get a, a high bonus, right. right? You can, if you do the right. following, the planning board can consider um, the high bonus. And here we mandated the actual pedestrian access to mitigate okay. any potential height. Greater than two to thirty-five feet. Okay, so, so that's you a did distinction. Actually lose, lose some of the benefits that were, were supposed to be created before. That's you've answered the question. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, we also were going to ask uh, about the question that Susan Neeters raised about the limitation on square footage of businesses in the OD. That seems important to help maintain the character of the central village and protect our main street merchants. Um, and um, Finally, the most notable new element of this version of the code is the Board of Trustees reviewing projects over 3,500 square feet. We're definitely in favor of the board serving as a backstop and taking what Mayor Morocco described last week as a big picture look at anything that this might have this much impact on the waterfront. Can we assume that the board's role uh, with this provision is to serve as a check on overdevelopment rather than provide a side door for it? That is, can you just reconfirm there won't be a situation where the ZBA or ARB turns down a project, but then it gets a green light from the trustees? There are no side doors in this code. Um, I think it's been answered that um, anything that comes to the board of trustees has come successfully through the boards below. Um, we will not uh, okay. be heard on a, uh, we will not act on a matter that did not uh, come forward as you just described. So the, the, the situation you described is moot. Okay. It doesn't happen. Because at, at the forum uh, last week, uh, my understanding was that there was, that there was not necessarily a, uh, a requirement that Projects be reviewed by the other boards first before going to the DBOs. No, there's no there's no requirement of which board they go to first. But like I said last time, um, 
that certain boards cannot approve something that doesn't comply with zoning. So it's very likely that people would end up going to CPA first, get variances, and then apply to the other boards. Okay. But each board has its own jurisdiction, and the Village Board of Trustees will not interfere with that jurisdiction in any way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, those are our questions. Thanks for the answers. Thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Randy Croxton, um, 115 Madison Street. And uh, again, I'm following on with Save Sack Harbor. And um, at the sometime back in, in front of you guys on the Zoom, I think, uh, we looked at not the things we're talking about here, the words, but went down at eye level and looked at recognizable buildings here in the village just to give a more immediate and personal sense of what the difference in that case was between uh, a code compliant of the existing code uh, compared to the waterfront overlay in June. And so now we have the November overlay and following on what Peter uh, mentioned, uh, there are physical changes uh, from the June overlay to the current overlay. Uh, and so we've gone through rushed because there has not been much, <laughs> much time. Uh, I literally saw this uh, about 45 minutes before I walked in this room. Uh, there, we basically just take the volumetrics from the zoning and do the dimensional. So it's really like monopoly pieces. Uh, and some people have misunderstood that what we're showing is actually the building. It is not the building. We're showing each facade which could exist under the, the uh, approved approach. Uh, and what that does is it shows you the maximum extent of incursion into the public way or into the public views. Uh, each one of those blocks would be carved out internally for parking or access or the architect's design. Uh, so just to give you that as a uh, as a clarification on on what we will show. So if uh, if we can just turn these lights off. If I could ask you a question, Mr. Cox. Sure. You say you only had 45 minutes? Before I came. <laughs> well, actually, I participated in the uh, in the review of all of the underlying statistics and the way that the information was generated, yes. <clears throat> so what circumstances limited you to 45 minutes and what were you limited to? I was uh, limited to the fact that the uh, the uh, bus that was uh, I was waiting for in front of the candy kitchen, the Hampton Jitney that was supposed to deliver uh, both the projector and the contents uh, from my office. Uh, the driver did not know. So it's just you just referring to your um, journey today. Yes. Um, this has been in the public domain oh, now for several weeks. Absolutely. So you had more than 45 minutes to look okay. at Oh, absolutely. I just want to clarify. Absolutely, that. of course. Thank you. Uh, certainly. Deputy Mayor Cardell, have you seen this video? Yeah. yeah. And it's it's preliminary and it calls itself preliminary and any critique or review or whatever we're certainly is it possible um, is it possible to turn down the lights just so people yeah, can see right there. is that yeah, yeah. That's that's okay. right there. Is this the first time screening? <laughs> no, no, world premiere. But everybody saw the previous screening where it compared the existing code to the previous graph. So this is the same thing, just adding the new graph onto it. So it's three different comparisons. And everybody saw that before. I have already registered with Mr. Craxton that I would like to have had the opportunity sure. to know what he was doing here tonight and to have seen it. So you are seeing something we have not seen. Either. None of us have seen it. Well, that's. Uh, 
sounds like a comment in favor of my support and concern here. So this is um, this is a baseline map in three dimensions that we have uh, actually presented uh, before. This is the uh, the expanded uh, waterfront. So you can see that it's uh, and and we're uh, delighted that uh, the attention is being uh, extended to the larger picture. Why don't you use the microphone so we can hear you? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that better? Uh, yeah, not yet. Testing. Is that better? Yeah. No. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I was saying that uh, this is a baseline map that we use just so that you can go down to ground level uh, and walk around the village and see the buildings in relation to each other. And this is the uh, previous extent of the, um, of the waterfront overlay. And of course, we now have quite a, uh, an increase. Uh, as we have been reviewing earlier, there is a sort of critical mass, as it were, of uh, the development that occurs that we're all familiar with, uh, which occurs as the bridge comes across, uh, the uh, referred to as Bay Street to West Water, uh, number two, main, uh, and a lot of the things, a lot of the elements remain the same. Uh, the, uh, the, the major changes occur uh, to the, uh, right now you can see the, the post office if it were acquired in the future, excuse me, it's here. Uh, and then we have dime and two-toe, all of these were two-story uh, in the previous, and they're three-story now. Uh, a lot of the other uh, areas uh, are very much the same. And then if we uh, sort of pull back to look at the bigger, oh yes, and, and Meadow Street as part of a planning issue is where we have one of the major view corridors out to the water. So now we're looking that, at. Show that corridor with your pointer, please. Sure. Randy, is the top aqua blue level the increase in height with this new? Yes, that's the, the uh, that is the setback third floor. And this is uh, as a planning issue. Meadow Street, which runs, you know, behind the cinema, and um, is is a public way, and as a fundamental planning objective, is to always align uh, your your views uh, from the public way out to the water. In this case, the bridge. Uh, we know that there are some discussions ongoing about two main and whether that would be there. Uh, but right now in the document, it's shown uh, as remaining. So what is uh, two main today? Port of Patrick. Port of Patrick. Okay, possible. Okay. So now we sort of come up to a larger view um, and the key uh, element here Uh, 
uh, is uh, the marine park. Uh, everything along here is what's hard to understand, and we'll get down to ground level. What's hard to understand at this scale is that uh, these are three story high buildings at this point, and right now uh, we have one story building. Uh, the, the particular uh, string, as it were, of buildings uh, that are uh, being of, of greatest interest are the string beginning with provisions in the corner bar and swinging along Bay Street, this whole assemblage here. There are three contributing buildings here, which are uh, in the historic uh, designation. And then there are, there are a total of seven parcels along here. And this was the point that Peter was making, is that these do not abut the water. So therefore, in this code, they will be uh, three stories. So we can, and again, I would Excuse just. Me, I have to stop you there. Yeah. Under this code, they will not, you're, you're making a declarative there that they oh. will be three stories. Could, could I be. thought they're village business, so I assume that they. Could be. Mean they will be. Could be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. No, that's be. a very good point. Thank you. Yeah. No, uh, so under the zoning approval of the massing, uh, they are listed as village business. And uh, it says that village business can be three stories. Of course, the contributing buildings would not uh, be going to be, well, under the Architectural Review Board, one would assume, but I'm not going to make any assumptions. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, the very point that we're making here is just simply to go down at ground level and to see what the impact is of the three-story configuration as we walk around the, the village. So this is the looking up the street uh, and we can see the, the impact of the three-story elements. Actually, the three-story element looks quite, I'm gonna go back just to, Oops, sorry. Can you identify the street, street by street, as you're pointing out these views? Sure, sure. Okay, this is Bay Street. I'm looking to the bridge in the distance. Yeah. To my left are the uh, the Harbor Pets, the liquor store, uh, and then uh, moving on to uh, uh, Dopio. Goop, the florist shop, the old bagel buoy, uh, and on the corner is Dime Bank, uh, and of course beyond is the bridge. To the right, uh, the tall lump there is actually the last fragment uh, in existence of the original uh, 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 whaling industry and industrial uh, uh, function down at the wharf, and that's the Xavier Studio. So if we allow uh, the three-story uh, development, uh, we see that it works fine for uh, the Malloy properties to the right. Uh, and if you look at the two-story portion next to the sort of original fabric of uh, Sag Harbor, which is uh, Goop and uh, the florist shop and so forth, uh, the two-story that we had before works quite well, but the three-story at this scale and this density is, is very difficult to accommodate. And now we move to look uh, up by the corner bar. And again, the corner bar to the left is um, uh, one story. And then far beyond, you see the post office there. Currently, Tuto does not have a building built out to the edge, nor does Dime Bank, but in theory, someone could in the future uh, build uh, at a three-story level, and the corner bar would actually go 
uh, two additional stories high at this condition. So that really creates an enormous, just at that coming off the bridge, a, a massive sort of confrontation or sort of choke point uh, at that entrance. To the right, frankly, because of two west water uh, and the amount of openness out to the water, um, the third floor is, is fine. Uh, and we understand that and that's part of the development. However, the third story on the left uh, is a new is new in this code, so uh, we find that to be unexpectedly uh, large. Can I ask for clarity that you're referring to the June plan where that area of town was brought to two stories? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and the so now we're looking straight on at the Malloy property. And they, sorry, my apologies. Okay, so you're seeing the Malloy property developed up to three stories. Beyond that, you see corner bar and provisions up at three stories. To the right of that, in the corner of this image, uh, in the upper right, uh, you see Tuto here. So this is. This is that heavy uh, intersection uh, that could come about in the future, and as the mayor points out, may not. Uh, but th this is the Dime Bank uh, and the Bagel Buoy developed at three stories. Uh, and this is the uh, Harbor Pets and Liquor Store developed at three stories. These are the three contributing uh, buildings, and this is the contributing building, the old flour mill uh, building it's referred to. Um, and uh, again, I think that uh, the, the original notion of two stories just for those seven properties, the one that the ones that Peter was talking about, uh, are really critical uh, as a sort of uh, village assembly. Uh, and the two story seems uh, very workable. But you're not showing the three stories with any setbacks. Uh, the three story, yeah, the three stories. In other words, like I said in, in the beginning, uh, and then of course, this is uh, all the way straight across. Uh, you're making a very good point, and I'll return to that. This just basically pushes us back up to the overview. Um, and the uh, I can't, I, every architect is going to go to every site, and they're basically going to take that volume that they can occupy, and they may come to the street because they have retail at the ground level. Okay. Whatever. So, yeah. Randy, one quick question. Yeah. Your master structures, have you taken into consideration the new sheds that would need to be open, or have you taken them right to the... Well, uh, to tell you, you know, I, I realize, uh, and I, I take the point that we should have uh, maybe been faster or quicker. Uh, we that I called it preliminary because I would like to have a full uh, walking, just a walking picture of what it would be and what the views would be. I, I find this completely unacceptable. This is an ambush. You are taking worst case assumptions, not distinguishing them as assumptions, and using visuals to, I think, concern. No, Jim, what he's saying is why, why was the new code, why was it changed? Why were the buildings changed to you know, that okay. three feet? That's all, why was that changed in the new code? I mean, because now they can be built up. So, what was the thinking? I have from Safe Safe Harbor or anybody else to allow you to take over the meeting with a presentation that has not been peer reviewed. It has not been seen by anyone. You're revealing it in this public space with the press. You're making declarative statements that are at this point unprovable. And uh, in many cases, um, uh, not uh, 
taking any account of all of the processes that are built into this. All of those uh, uh, boards that we have, including the part of trustees that will now be able to deal with oversized or large buildings, and assuming the fullest worst outcome in every case. I think we're just asking why it was changed in the new draft. Why did you make the buildings higher? Respectfully, Hillary, I'm not asking the question. You're presenting a thesis that is unexamined and un. We just showed what could happen. We're, we're delighted to have it examined and we're delighted to engage in whatever process you think would be appropriate. I, I'm. I have no. Well, I'm completely. Our our mission is an educational one. We try to raise the issues. We're focusing only on a change. We have seven properties that went from two stories to three stories. We're just trying that to- That very sentence that went from. I just want to end this here. I find this an unacceptable presentation. I think if you want to- ways We could have been having this discussion. This right. is not one of them. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know why you didn't take the courtesy, um, and I have great regard for Safe Sand Harbor, but you don't bring something like this in. It was done right? at the 11th hour, that's why we apologize. I mean, we but just literally got it. And you're right. That's well, um, we were actually, I was afraid that this was the last hearing. Well, you, our public <laughs> schedule is well known. So I appreciate that you've apologized. I appreciate you had mistakes in your assumptions. And I, uh, I regret that you use some language and presentation here that I think is uh, very misleading and okay. um, uh, is, uh, uh, has the potential to mislead the public about what's at stake. Okay. Uh, you've got the Malloy property, a big giant box uh, over the parking lot. All the way down to the water? That's not no. going to happen. Yeah. That's yeah. just not going to happen. And you know that. You have to know that. And um, I appreciate that you're in good faith, but I don't see this. And, and as my chair, I'm going to ask you to discontinue the presentation right now. Oh, it's done. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. And we'll go back to hearing public comment. Okay. And uh, this is a our business. Okay. Right, it is a public comment. Sorry, it's not just that this is a public comment. Sorry, right. so we will resume you like to be heard next? I mean, I was with Stephen Lutz for six years when he wrote Sir Oliver. I can't hear the louder. That's, that's, that's where it's just one more. Try that again. By the hand, the hand mic. Pick up the other one. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Stephen Lapla, 68, Whitney Road, Sag Barber. I was going to begin on another matter. However, I just want to continue on with the, with the regarding the individual that made the comments <clears throat> concerning the residential usage with, within the waterfront overlay district. I also agree that that particular use has been there for quite some time, and I believe that it should continue as well. It does provide that mixed use that everyone finds very attractive in the village. And also, insofar as, you know, we all are very much in on the same page in terms of maintaining the character of Sag Harbor. That's a given. However, we, those of us that own property and have desires to live within a certain area in the village, we should not become collateral damage to having a, to achieve that vision for Sarah Harbor and maintaining that character. Uh, and I don't think that by 
excluding completely and prohibiting residential uses is, a, is the right way to go. So I think that that should be removed. Um, with reference to, and I think this came about within the last uh, presentation, the third story setbacks. I can understand that it makes perfect sense from the front, from the street, that there be a 10 foot setback. However, on the side setbacks, there are any number of mitigating circumstances that would require someone who's building to have less of a setback or more of a setback, depending on the mechanicals and any number of things. In addition to which, there's often, uh, there's a lot of uh, code language here. There's a lot of code language here with reference to uh, setbacks in the front and on the sides of the, of the buildings. However, there is, doesn't say anything about the rear of the buildings, and there's never, there hasn't been any type of, uh, there hasn't been any type of uh, introduction of any uh, uh, law or code that and maybe it's something for the ARB that would have someone or have a board evaluate the way that the waterfront district looks from the water. And I think that that's a very important part of this as well. I mean, because that's certainly, you know, you want to maintain a visual character for the village. The one from the water is certainly one that is very appealing and should should also get some attention in terms of the stuff. I think it's the whole that might be the bottom of the back. Oh, I didn't know I was doing it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, there are I have a number of other things, but they pertain to the code as they pertain to the code in other areas of the code and would probably follow through with any other changes to the code. For example, uh, when you're talking about height restrictions and what contributes to height, there are certain things such as the elevator. There's a, usually on the top of the elevator, there is a certain space for security and safety, which has to be there by law. And quite often that is used as a contributory factor to the height of the building. And things like that should be excluded, including the access to the roof, where you have a stairway that leads to the roof that's covered if you have a third story access to the, if you have an access to the third story, it's naturally going to exceed the height limitation just by virtue of the fact that the, the you have a roof that's covering uh, a stairway. But nonetheless, that has to be there as well by code, by law. So those are some of the things that probably pertain to other buildings within the city, within the within the village. But uh, I just thought I would mention them because. We speak often of the height restrictions here in the waterfront overlay district. And that's all that I have for this part of it. Thank you, Stephen. And this follows much of the discussion you and I have been having. Yes. Uh, uh, and I know there are more, and I think you've given us some of this in writing. Um, well, I will. But if you have. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony? Good evening, Anthony Vermigoff. Good evening, Anthony Vermigoff, 68 Union Street. Hello. 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 All right. Good evening, Anthony Vermigoff, 68 Union Street. Okay, so I uh, came here tonight with uh, two questions, comments, and I think I'm going to add a third one after the seeing the safe Sag Harbor presentation. Um, first question is, is where we're uh, determining um, a height. Um, uh, permitted height of structures um, uh, from measured from street or lowest grade on site. Is there um, any particular reason why that was uh, decided to be the determining uh, point and not the FEMA elevation? Yeah. It, it's to keep them that we have, it's in the village code right now. Right? Yeah, no, I, I, I know that the village code is, is basically that way. It's not taken from FEMA, so it's taken from- We don't line up with an extra six feet and then 35 feet. Yeah. And if mm -hmm. some of these things are followed through with commercial on the first floor where you can do flood proofing, the first floor can be lower than the three million. Okay. But the building then from apparent grade is no taller. Yeah. And I'm not gonna not gonna argue with the thing. I just wanted to make sure that that was taken into consideration. 
Um, the, the second thing, though, that I think I have a much bigger issue is uh, uh, item K here about residential uses and uh, no residential use being permitted on waterfront properties uh, within the VB or OD uh, districts within the, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I know that that's, they, I know why that's there. Obviously it's there to get, uh, prevent uh, things like the Bialski, uh development. But, you know, I mean, we're talking about here, we've been talking all night about um, uh, obtainable housing. I think you mentioned the term floating housing and needing to create uh, housing anywhere we possibly can. Um, you know, the way the zoning is now in R20, I mean, you couldn't, it, it's almost impossible. I've brought this up many times to the board before. It's almost on top possible to uh, create accessory housing, even if you wanted to. And now here, it's like you're, you're saying, okay, we're just going to ban it outright. Um, I would suggest that maybe this should be modified to allow that possibility, even if it's a remote one. I mean, maybe it's it's something where you don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, condominiums and single family dwellings are not allowed, but um, uh, apartments under, say, 1,500 square feet are allowed. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just clarifying that the um, the residential element that you just uh, objected to has been part of the draft since the very beginning. Hmm. I think you know. Yeah, I mean, I maybe I just didn't. That's not a recent change. Pick, I, I I understand. I just maybe just didn't pick it up, and I, I frankly haven't been following this earlier in the process because I've been busy with other other things. But so maybe a little new to the process. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's something that that maybe needs to be worked on a little bit, just some sort of provision there. So there's even a remote chance of getting some uh, additional housing in the uh, in the overlay district, it can, it can be acted upon. Um, Tony, are you, are you suggesting affordable waterfront condos? <laughs> well, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I, I, I'm not suggesting that per se. I, I think maybe what I'm saying is, is that, I mean, like there, there's some, um, you know, the, the buildings on the south side of, of, um, of Bay Street, for example, which we, we were just talking about, that, about them being re redeveloped potentially. Um, you know, I mean, those might be some spots where there could be some, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, ha additional housing. I'm not saying that, you know, when, when, if, and when, um, uh, the Malloy building is, is redeveloped, that's going to be affordable housing. Obviously it's not, but you know, uh, there, there are other parts of this district. I think that there's a little bit of, um, the way that the language is written, it says waterfront properties. Um, it really is that there would be no residential uses on the waterfront lots as defined by this code, which are actually the lots that are fronting on the water and on waterfront parks. So okay. Anything within the rest of the overlay district, you would still be allowed to have accessory apartments in the VB district by special exception or an apartment building in the OD by special exception. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that, that, so, that actually puts me a lot more at ease than, yeah, I understand that. that than, 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 yeah. In the yeah. Code. Okay, that, that puts me a little more at ease about that. Um, I think the third thing that I would just want to mention, just as kind of an aside here, I mean, we're talking about that in the presentation about the six feet consternation about the possibility of the Harbor Pets being building being redeveloped as three stories. Just think I would like to remind everybody that there was a three story building there. Uh, there was a huge three story hotel in that very spot. Uh, I don't know when it burned down, but you know, like so many other buildings in Sac Harbor, it's gone away. Except the Thank you. Thank you. Are there comments? Yes, sir. I see a hand. Oh, my name is Dave Shorey. Um, I do remember that whole thing. But uh, I just want to say that presentation that that man presented is totally out of character of this world. Absolutely, totally out of character. You can't let that happen. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Yes, sir. On this subject. What? I, on this subject? Yeah, I'd like to speak on the waterfront zone. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. My name is Steve Brennan. Uh, I'm a director of Sag Harbor Yacht Club. I, I think you'll remember I was here at the work session uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and my point was trying to get the zoning maps corrected for our dock. Okay. Uh, 
Again, this week, I see the map has a change. I'm, pre I'm presuming this is a provisional map to accompany this waterfront Wibble district. I certainly hope so. Uh, I'd also like to note that not only is the zoning map wrong, but also you have the historic over, uh, overlay district, uh, I guess, that in, that's also in it. And you've also put our dock in your waterfront overlay district. So regular zoning, waterfront overlay, and historic district. Three times you've included our dock outside of your jurisdiction. I know you asked me, what harm does it do? And I say that to me is not the point. The point is your jurisdiction ends at the bulkhead, plain and simple. It's a state law. So I'm just asking once again on behalf of our yacht club, who's been a good neighbor for 123 years. And we're just asking for you to recognize that this goes, so to speak, a bridge too far. Okay. <laughs> a dock too far. Yes. No other, no other dock in the village of Sag Harbor is treated this way. Do any others have a building on them? By chance? Pardon me? Do any others have a building on them? Just curious. I, personally, I don't know. But the building was put there, I believe, in 1913. So it does have a little bit of being there before your zone. <laughs> Is this working? No. No. Is this one working? Yes. It will. I can speak. I can speak pretty loud. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Trustees. Uh, my name is Rob Camarino, Sag Harbor Yacht Club. Uh, Mr. Brennan's right. We have, in every way possible, told not only your board of trustees, the past board of trustees, for years, we've written letters. The attorneys for the village know this. General New York State law, village jurisdiction, and it mean high water or bulkhead. Mr. Downs has pointed this out. He could not be here tonight. Uh, so we really don't understand because Mayor Mulcahy, the previous mayor, uh, told us that the reason the lines were not removed is because the village didn't have the funds. But since that time, there have been more maps produced that have changed, including the, the current one that includes non-waterfront properties per your own definition. So we're a little confused on a number of issues, what's really happening. And it appears that there's a solution looking for a problem. Mr. Grignon, who could not be here tonight, who's the manager and former owner of the Sag Harbor Yacht Yard that open and notoriously is the longest running business in Sag Harbor. You can check it over 200 years. The Yacht Club's 123 years, as Mr. Brennan said. Your zoning started in 1957. So up until that time, the stewards of the waterfront, and we're currently still the stewards of the waterfront, have done quite a good job on their own. There are eight properties from Long Wharf, over to Port Maria. Five of them are owned by the village. So when we went to the initial, which is a few years ago, a trustees meeting, and the raison d'etre of this code was to stop a 40 foot corridor down Bay Street, we pointed out, is Marine Park gonna have a 40 foot story building? Is the sewage treatment plant, which is the only property that blocks public views of the waterfront? Is the, are the village owned parking lots? is Breakwater Yacht Club, which by the way, I project managed uh, through a CO, which is on the village property. You all know that, it's a leased property. Where are the 40 foot buildings going? So there's a lot of questions we have. What is the real reason for this new overlay district? Uh, where are, what are the problems you're solving? Uh, this is the golden goose. If, I've only been here 40 years. I'm a newbie. I've been all over that waterfront for over 30 years in many capacities. That's the golden goose of this village. If you were here 40 years ago, and many of you were, you'd know what Sag Harbor was like then. Uh, we're really trying to figure out, and there are some legitimate problems. There are three cubes. I won't get into that. In the center of this village and historic district, I know Mr. Bialski, I know. 
I, I, I'm not getting into that. There's a sewage treatment plant that was put on the harbor, a village with the name Harbor in it, should not be spewing effluent into its own harbor. There's a rumor going around, there's a new motto, Sag Harbor, where the affluent meet their effluent. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's around, that's how I heard about it. I mean, I, I, you know, left to our own devices, you're not gonna have a problem with the water front. And, and and I don't want to say anything because it's piling on. And Mr. Mayor, I thank you. I saw that presentation first on the Zoom meeting. And it's easy to put cubes that are looming over everyone at the property lines. But if you know anything about the zoning code, there's parking regulations. There's a pyramid law, sir. You ought to look into that because you could never do what you have shown, and that's a scare tactic, and I'm done with fake news, so that's what that is. That's and, what I said. And, no, and you're good, you're a good example showing what great things, it's all peek through shingles, and we all agree with that. Left to our own devices, that's all we want. We love Sag Harbor, we cherish it. You can ask Mr. Korsh, we have been trying for years to get that sewage treatment plant to stop spewing into the harbor. It was the village, this is true, look it up. The original approval for that plant ran the pipe out past the breakwater so it could flush without going tides. And because of money, they went to Albany, they cut it off of the bulkhead. The kids all summer are in sailing class next to that. I used to dive on my boat years ago. I wouldn't dare anymore because you know what bumps into you? I don't wanna say it, you can imagine. And so on I and on. There no, no, Mr. Course, you I don't think we're even here when I used to dive on my book. No, so, we're talking about what you just said is happening out there right now. And the truth of the matter is, I would like to direct you to Dr. Goldberg's report. I know I, I've analyzed the report and we can meet with you because you did the last report during COVID when half the village was closed. It's why we didn't participate. We were the largest financial donor, you know it, and the first donor to that project. Then you stopped. It's no longer the Sag Harbor Water uh, Water Quality Initiative, isn't it? That's and so anyway. No, don't, okay. I'm just okay. saying. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've taken so, you guys on tours through that plant. I've done everything. You, all yes, of you the did. Okay. possible. I won't show you every single thing of how that plant works. There's nothing hidden there. Everything is totally up front. We've had Goldberg in there for the last two years, mm -hmm. measuring water that. Uh, Testing water before it goes out. That's for another meeting. meeting. I'm not going to. Okay, well, it seems you opened up that conversation. No, no, but I'm saying the these are all the things time. that everyone should know. And, and, and these are smart people that can yes, decide for their own. Okay. Sorry, I apologize. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Um, you say when 1957, when the first code came in, yeah. how was, and there was a structure on the dock then? Right where it is. Okay. And was it included in the, was the map as it is drawn now? No, I think that started under Mayor Hans, who couldn't get in the yacht club. <laughs> look it up. What, year, what period of time do you think? Uh, you have to look up when Mr. Hans was uh, mayor. When I moved my chair forward. I just turned 65. <laughs> But it's just, right. I, I hear you. Um, we would like, because we said this so many times, sir, that there's some response. And that line is the only dot in Sag Harbor. Look at your zoning map. It's called spot zoning. And we've been a great member of this, uh, this community. We put on fireworks for a long time. Because why? Because a village couldn't do it. And because that's what you do when you're, when you're gifted. When you when you're lucky, and we have we the amount of scholarships I'm not pounding our chest, we give out to the local community, and on and on and on. And there's no there's no give and take here whatsoever. Okay, um, so that's my right. I just I'm, um, I'm more open minded on this one than you might assume. Um, when you say it's the only dock, mm -hmm. you're excluding Longwood. That's your dock. It's not private. I should use the word pride. So, um, and that's is, actually a wharf. It is a structure out into the water. It looks very much like a dock, a wharf, a pier. So, I mean, three or four other things. But I'm just asking to clarify. Okay. When you say this is the only one, it's the only private one, and, and dimensionally, it's 
and they're dropping technical war for sure. Um, when this happened, and it was the very you know, the first time in the maps, and I presume you object, somebody objected on behalf of the club back then. What was the explanation when it was first? They don't respond. Mr. Downs has written letters to the previous village attorneys. Zero okay. response. To the extent it was in the period. No, we do it every few seven. years. We keep doing it and we get no response no matter who we write. But is there any <coughs> understanding of what the rationale, if any, was when it was first included? Is my, is my question. No. No. Yeah. Up and Not that we're aware of. That's the answer. Then. All right. That's all I figured. Right. And, and you make a distinction between that and the wharf. Okay. I understand. And, 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 and the wharf is, is the village's property. So the village should do what they think is for the public good. But we're a private club with private property. And we're open and notorious. And we're not, we only help. We don't hurt anything. And it's the same, you know. I, if I could, just one one quick point, and that is, I believe what you're referring to is a section of Malloy's dock that was not originally in the waterfront zone, but then the section of the waterfront dock that goes up right along the side of the uh, water became included in a later iteration of the map. I don't believe it was originally there, because it was a very nuanced little change where they originally it just went right down the side of the bulkhead, then they kicked it out and came down the side of that dock. Okay, I've got it. I'm looking. And I'll mention one other thing, and I don't know if any of you remember this. The last time you upsung the waterfront, there were two waterfront districts. There was one inside the bridge and one outside in the harbor. And that worked really well because a lot of your problems that you're trying to tackle are inside the bridge. The condos are things. And the one gentleman who lives there, near Christy Brinkley's parents' house over there. But when it combined into one waterfront district, it sort of hogtied you that. Now, when you make some changes. So, too far okay, but I'm just saying, so a lot of these problems have been created by what the village did, not what the community right. did. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. What else can be heard? Um, uh, thank you all. What we'll do is uh, the public uh, hearing remains open. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no action for us to do that. Uh, I, anybody who wasn't heard or those who were heard who would like to amplify and uh, clarify in writing, we would appreciate that uh, very much. And uh, we'll move on to the next item, which is the uh, local law. Um, chapter 300. Uh, this is the uh, Okay. Um, the public hearing process is open on um, item number uh, three, uh, two, 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 or two, or and item number four. Does anybody care to be heard on either of those items? I'm hearing on the public hearings. Uh, um, uh, those three items remain open um, and uh, are uh, continued. Um, I'm sorry, uh, which item is that? Uh, chapter 300 zoning? Yes. The uh, um, non conforming uses? Yes. 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 Jim, we're having a hard time hearing you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the two. Uh, Companion measures have been um, uh, immediately following uh, both zoning article uh, 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 and our items number three and four. Um, let's do it. Okay, uh, this I'll be very quick about this. The only thing that I feel should be added to this is that those applications which are already in and being reviewed be exempt from this. Uh, from this new zoning code, 
uh, using the language that's been used or proposed in the past that, exempt, that it all exempt all applications pending before one or more of the regulatory boards at the, that are, that are um, pending before one or more of the regular regulatory boards at this time that may be affected by the changes here. Okay. I understand. I understand this point. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Anyone else on these uh, two other items? All right. So the public hearings in all three of those items continue, and we move now to um, uh, I think I reported on the on the leaf pickup in some way. So we'll get to action items. The first is an application to install a replacement temporary facility, um, so-called uh, cell on wheels. This was introduced and put over um, at the last meeting. Um, at the time, I think the thinking of this chairman and this board was that we expected and had asked for additional uh, explanation and information from the uh, company, from Verizon, and I will tell you that at 7-Eleven last night, we received a multi-page document from Verizon um, uh, electronically, and it was delivered this morning. So we have not had a chance to process that today. So it would be my um, uh, recommendation that we continue uh, the uh, open uh, uh, the table of this item because we have not received anything new since our meeting of Four weeks ago. Try the other one. Is anyone care to be heard on the Verizon cow um, cell on wheels? Somebody said Bill Evans. I don't recognize Bill Evans. <laughs> Okay, so you are not still in. Yeah, Steve Hamilton, Redwood Road. Um, it sounds to me as though, uh, the Mayor, you're recommending that uh, this proposal be tabled. Is that correct? It is currently, it was tabled from last meeting to this, and it would continue to be tabled while we digest the submission we had overnight from Horizon. I urge the board to uh, follow Jim's lead and table this um, application until there is more time to digest the information that came in. Um, I think that there's a lot of answers that still need to be, uh, a lot of questions that still need to be answered. The need for it, for instance. I know that things have changed on the ground since um, uh, the, uh, uh, that the uh, equipment was placed in the cupola. So until we get a chance to see a coverage map, um, I think it's important, you know, to have that, the, the question answered whether it's actually needed. Um, that's one thing. I think also, again, I think it's important for us to really question whether Verizon is a trustworthy partner in this because, again, two days before the most significant weather um, uh, incident in 30 years mm -hmm. to hit Long Island, her, uh, Hurricane Ari, the, the temporary cow was removed and, and taken to, um, you know, the, uh, the open in, in, in Flushing. So I'm just questioning whether even, you know, and to get this application, you know, hours before, you know, the meeting, it just, it, it just rank, it just rankles me, you know, to, to to see that happen. That's all I have. Thanks very much for listening. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, anyone else? Who's me? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that, that um, they figured out ways to put uh, cellular equipment on top of the lights at high schools. Um, you can't really notice them. Um, they figured out ways to put them in trees. So there, are, there's a whole bunch of innovative stuff out there, and I don't know if anyone's talking about that, but I thought I would just serve that up because we used to do that. Thanks. Thank you. 
I just wanted to say the reason that the cow was originally approved was we were having, and I believe we're still having problems with cell service in the village in areas of the village. People, I was getting multiple complaints, people calling 911 and not being able to get to the dispatch. They were either sent to South Hold in some cases, and then they had to be reconnected to Southampton or East Hampton. And it was a major delay on emergency services. When the cow went up, there definitely was improvement without a doubt. So I just would say, just take that into consideration when you're thinking about this or speaking out against it. And we did get some response from Verizon, but as the mayor said, we just got it. It's pages long and we need to go over it. But I just wanted to remind the public. Good question. Has that changed? Um... To my knowledge, it hasn't. It hasn't really changed. So there are certain areas if you call nine one one, you cannot get through. Or there's a there's a major delay. You can get through, but it takes time. And as we know, in an emergency situation, a couple of minutes could be the, could be the you know between something that could be mitigated right away or a bigger problem. So Jim, I have a question. Did we get did we get any notification from Verizon prior to the removal of the cow when it, when it was taken up to Cushing? If we're depending on this as an emergency uh, aspect to our village's response, there is a letter which I actually have here somewhere where they wrote to us, and in the very first, uh, and this was like August nineteenth, a couple of days before all this in which they said because of the emergent need to bring the cow to the U.S. Open, they were removing it. There was no reference to the storm. And in the uh, quick read I've given the document that's come in now, um, there is again no reference uh, whatever to the storm, but simply to questions that were raised. So essentially we have a two weeks notice in the middle of our ICU. Can I just respond to that? It was yeah. right. kind of days, not days, days. right. So the cow is, is a temporary, just a temporary fix. We really need to look at how to fix this permanently. Susan brings up some ideas, but this is just was just a temporary or is a temporary fix. There's, I believe, another application in the works for WLNG. The permanent tower or repair the permanent tower that's there. Is this a Verizon specific problem or is it all kept now? ATT and all of them. I have Sprint and I've had problems. So it's not just. Yeah, there, um, I think, and at various points in COVID, there were days that were severe uh, and the system was simply overlooked. Um, there is an application, we cannot discuss it here tonight. There is an application for the radio tower, which has not been renewed in uh, many decades. Uh, and for those who uh, want to express concerns on the general subject, uh, it is in those procedures uh, that uh, there will be public records, the various boards uh, have that application before. But it's not before the village board that we cannot discuss it. The current tower is proposed that has AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint. They're all supported by the same equipment? Yeah, the only one side with two. All right, um, so is it our sentiment to keep them out of the table? Um, yeah. right, is there a second? Yeah. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The matter is opposed. Proposed to table. Well, I think that is a need, so I would, I would. Proposed. The matter is agreed to. Um, next up, resolution to do the monthly budget transfer. Item number two is there a motion? Second. All those in favor by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The matter is agreed to. Next up, Nicholas Samet, president of the Santa Barbara PDA, requests permission to place Santa's mailbox on Main Street 
uh, for the holiday season. Is there a motion? Is there a second? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Matter is agreed to. Uh, Jessica Van Hagen of the North David Village Improvement Society requests permission to use a fire truck for the annual Santa visit to North Haven. I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Chief McGuire requests permission to put on out to a 2015 Ford Interceptor utility for a minimum bid of $1,000. It's a great time, right. folks. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Um, Colleen Gregonis of the Fire Department Ladies Auxiliary requests event permission for Girls' Night Out on November 21st. Um, is there a motion? Move. Second. <coughs> All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion only, and by the way, includes a sign on the grassy uh, part of the board. Um, Authorization to refund the following small claimed assessments. Uh, 2019, Gene Connolly and Valerie Hedgehill. 2020, Jonathan Morse, Gail Pinto. Uh, is there a motion in combination? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Next up is a, um, um, a resolution uh, to uh, or a, uh, an approval a special event permit for the second annual voters cancer drive uh, requested by Duncan Darrow, founder and chairman of Fighting Chance. Uh, and it's a 10 year old now uh, organization uh, directly involved in the battles against cancer. Um, and uh, the uh, request also includes the use of 13 slips on the transient dock during the event uh, for which the um, chairman is um, uh, will pay the village uh, in the amount of three thousand dollars. Is there a motion? I'll move it. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Duncan, did you want to be heard? No, thank you very much. Okay. So I like you are, you are <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much. much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, next up, Richard Scavoni, Secretary of the Dep Department, requests that we accept the application of Jack McClellan to the Montauk Post Company to accept the resignation in good standing of Sean Dushman and remove him from the roles and accept the resignation in good standing of ex-Chief Miller and place him on the honorary roles. I just want to say a word about Chief Miller, who I know well, and uh, uh, wish him all the best in um, his uh, forward motion. Uh, he's a great asset to this community and to uh, certainly to the fire brigade. Um, is there a motion on these three personal matters in the fire department? I will regretfully accept Steve's resignation. Move to the honorary roles and the other members also. There are All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, Thomas Cartino of the Lions Club request permission to have the annual Christmas tree sale on Longwood uh, starting November 15 next week. Uh, through January 15th. Is there a motion? Is there a second? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Resolution provisionally appointing Brooke Montfort to the position of office assistant. This is in Village Hall, uh, the first floor of Village Hall. A uh, very fine young woman. Um, and uh, is there a motion to make this appointment? Second? Second? All those uh, in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Um, next up, authorizing the mayor to sign the service award program service fee agreement with Penflex. This is the outfit that looks after the uh, uh, points uh, for the fire fire uh, uh, personnel. Um, Make a motion. Is there a second? All okay. well, in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Uh, President O'Brien of the Ambulance Corps uh, uh, requests the authorization to accept the resignation of Abigail Halleck. In good standing and remove her from the insurance rules. Make the motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Alan Diogardi, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, requests permission to light up the windmill and tree on Long Wharf on December 4, uh, December 5th, rain date from 4 to 6 30 p.m. Also requesting to place signage on the grassy uh, area of Long Wharf. 
Um, the, it does only takes a minute to turn on the lights, but there's a lot of festivity that goes with that event. It's a nice event on this, uh, I presume that's a Saturday. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? Well, unheard, it is approved. Uh, Ellen uh, also has a Chamber of Commerce request to have the annual Santa visit to the windmill on December 11th from 3 to 6.30 p.m. Also requesting the use of a fire truck to bring Santa down to the window. I'll make the motion. And signage. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? second? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, authorized. Next up, uh, resolution authorizing agreement with the trustees of the freeholders and com commonality of the town of East Hampton. Uh, this is for the um, uh, annual agreement. Uh, that uh, we have for shared services, I believe. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Um, we have a liquor application for the Sag Harbor Cinema. Um, and uh, uh, it's an updating of uh, a uh, application already in. Um, and I uh, would hear a motion. Uh, to approve. I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, next up, an authorization for professional services related to uh, the emergency services building um, uh, using the uh, uh, engineering environmental term of PW Grocer. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Next up, uh, the gross reform again. This is for 21, 2021 professional, professional services related to the upgrades at the firehouse. This is to uh, uh, help implement the uh, actions under the $250,000 grant <coughs> that we have uh, 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 pending. Um, and this will come out of the, this is part of the budget that we budgeted for. This is the part we budgeted already. And the other, all the motion also for the Retaining that services for the RFP. Right. Um, yes, we, uh, there's another one for an RFP um, all, all rolled up into one. Um, okay. Next up is to amend the inter municipal uh, agreement. I'll make the motion. I'll second. 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 Aye. 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 Okay. Next up is to amend the IMA with the town of Southampton for fire marshal services. This is an evolution from East Hampton to Southampton, um, and we are going to do it on a new basis of uh, uh, being charged by the hour. It's a mutually negotiated. Um, we think it's a good arrangement for both houses. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Next up, St. Andrews requests permission to place the annual nativity scene at the Civil War Monument from the 4th of December to the 8th of January. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. <clears throat> All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Next up, the improvement, uh, the approval of the payment of bills under warrant number 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. What did I miss now? We must have an old uh, there's a resolution for November 2021 authorization to issue RFP for consulting services associated with infrastructure project development. I did skip over that because it's on a separate sheet. It's not because I'm losing my <laughs> Yes, you might conclude. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, is there a motion? I'll second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed? It is agreed to. Now the warrants 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26 at the varying amount stated. Uh, this is the monthly uh, approvals. Is there a motion uh, for the five in bond? So moved. And is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, how do we have 15 minutes left for a public no, session? I'm You're wondering if we've like broken any time. records tonight of the length of the meeting. I never kept track over the years. Oh, yeah. 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 Except I, I was looking at the clock. Yeah. Just yeah. decided yeah. I stayed yeah. till the end. Yeah. 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 Anyway, thank you for your your fidelity to this board. <laughs> Much appreciated. Uh, maybe I did it for myself. Let's face it. Let's be honest. Uh, 
Okay, all those in favor of adjourn? Aye. Thank you. And um, the meeting is adjourned. Uh,